Welcome to episode 207 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm going to help you examine three limiting beliefs about students. Visit truthforteachers.com to ask a question or share your thoughts in the comments. If you ever use a paper flip chart, you know that after one use, you're done. Now more than ever, especially with many teaching from home, we have to be more efficient. Check out Whitebook Flip Chart at whitebook.com forward slash truth for teachers. These flip charts are reusable dry erase surfaces that make it so easy to snap a picture and upload it to your Google Drive or Dropbox for quick sharing with your students. Go to whitebook.com forward slash truth for teachers and receive 30% off your order. If you want to combine a love of teaching with a love of travel, I hope you'll join us on a trip through BBT Adventures. They're an innovative PD company founded by teachers to allow educators to learn from each other internationally. On your trip, you receive 20 plus PD hours and you get to explore an amazing country with a small, safe group of fellow educators. You can learn from teachers in places like South Africa, Egypt, Australia, Germany, and Finland, where I'll be leading a BBT Adventures trip in 2021. Spots are limited, so check availability at bbtteachers.com. So today's episode could be a little uncomfortable to listen to because I might be saying things that are sort of convicting to you. You might hear about some mistakes that you can relate to or beliefs that you've had that really haven't served you or your students well. I hope you'll choose to use this episode as a springboard for your growth and a discussion about ways that we can do better for kids, because we're all doing the best we can with what we know now. And as Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you do better. If you know more in 15 minutes when this episode is done, then you're going to be in a better place and be able to show up for your kids the way they need you to much better than when you started. So let's take the first step and talk about the first limiting belief. The first belief that you might hold, which could limit or constrain your success in the classroom with kids in some way, is the belief that some kids just don't want to learn. I don't believe it's true that a student is not interested in learning. A student may not be interested in learning what you want to teach, or learning it the way you want them to learn it, um, or participating in class, or turning in assignments. But that doesn't mean the student doesn't want to learn or that it will be impossible to get them on board, that there's no way to reach them, that they're not interested in preparing for their future, or that they don't want to be a success in life. Everyone wants to be a success in life. We all define that differently, and your students may have ideas about how they want to live that don't align with your belief system and what you think is best for them. But let's be clear, no child wants to be a hopeless loser who never learns anything and does nothing with their life, no matter how much it seems. That's not human nature. We all want to win. So if a student does not want to learn in class, that's very different from just not wanting to learn or just not caring. And it's not just a semantical difference. This is a difference in the fundamental way that we address and understand student motivation. It doesn't mean that you're going to have to make every task in your class super exciting. doesn't mean you have to make everything fun or doesn't mean that the student doesn't have any responsibility for meeting you halfway. What we're looking at here is simply limiting beliefs. You cannot allow yourself to consciously or subconsciously believe that there are students in your class who just don't care about anything because it's not true. You just haven't yet discovered the things that the student does care about or you haven't yet found a way to make school relevant to the things that the student cares about. It's important for the child's sake and also for yours that you let go of a limiting belief that kids don't care. It's extremely demoralizing to feel like you are walking into a classroom every single day where half the class doesn't want to learn. So stop telling yourself that. It's not true. Believing that is going to kill your motivation for teaching. It's going to make it harder for you to reach those kids. That belief is not serving you well. Those kids are already disengaged. The last thing that they need is a teacher who doesn't believe that they're ever going to amount to anything. 
So stay focused on the things that motivate you and excite you about teaching so you can bring that enthusiasm to the classroom. Your students are more likely to be engaged when you're excited about what's happening in the classroom and you're taking a genuine interest in your students. And when you can let go of limiting beliefs about them and you begin to see their potential again, it's a lot easier to be excited about teaching them. No one would be excited about teaching someone who they think nothing you say is ever going to stick and it's not going to make a difference, right? You are making a difference. Now, I know I'm kind of getting into your stuff a little bit here. I'm stepping on some toes, but this is tough love and it's meant to better you for the sake of your students. We can't complain that kids don't have grit and perseverance to follow through with the task and that they, you know, don't keep trying when things get hard if we're not modeling that with them. If we're giving up on kids because they're not putting forth enough effort, when we stop trying because they stop trying, then what we're modeling for them is that same behavior that they're giving back to us. It's an endless cycle, right? We're the adults in the room. We're the professionals. We're responsible for breaking the cycle. So when you have a student who's disengaged, if you don't want him or her to give up on the learning process or give up on school, then don't give up on that student. If you want that student to come in every single day ready to learn and ready to give his or her best, then it's important that you also come ready to give your best each day. Remember, kids can feel when adults don't believe in them or don't like them or don't see the potential in them. This is not so much about what you say as it is about how you make them feel. So root out that limiting belief that students don't want to learn or don't care and you could avoid making it a self-fulfilling prophecy. The second limiting belief that you might want to root out today is that my job is to keep the kids who don't want to learn from ruining it for the kids who do want to learn. And here's why that's a limiting belief. Your job as a teacher is not just to teach the kids who want to learn. It's to teach them all, to reach them all, or at least never give up trying, right? And when we segment our class into kids who want to learn, and the kids who don't, what we're saying, in fact, is that there are good kids and bad kids. And then we end up wanting to get the bad kids out of our hair, out of the room, where they can't disrupt the learning for the good kids. Now, I know this is a frustrating experience as a teacher, and I know that you can't force anyone to learn. And there are some kids for whom it's going to feel impossible to engage them. But when we create this dichotomy in the classroom, we're giving ourselves permission to stop trying with certain students. And though this might be the hardest and maybe least favorite part of teaching, continuing to try on behalf of students who are not trying, on behalf of students who are not putting forth their own effort, it's part of the job. We can't write off a portion of the class as unwilling to learn. And I think most of us know that the way to solve this problem is by identifying the root cause of the behavioral issue, right? Figure out why the student isn't focused. Why isn't the student putting forth any effort? And figure that out and help the child succeed. But our limiting beliefs are what keep us from acting on that knowledge. On a conscious or on a subconscious level, we believe there are kids in our class who just don't want to learn or who just aren't capable of learning. And therefore, the only thing we can do, if that's true, is to try to make sure that they don't keep the other kids from getting a good quality education. And it's that limiting belief that causes us to get frustrated. It's not the kids themselves. It's not how the kids are behaving. It's our belief about the kids' behavior that creates frustration and makes that task of engaging all of our students just feel impossibly hard. These are very common and very understandable limiting beliefs. And I'll share with you that I have battled with these things myself. That's how I know how destructive they are. Because a belief like, I have to make sure the bad kids don't interfere with the good kids who do want to learn, I've held that belief before. And you know what happened? It caused me to start saying things to my kids like, if you don't want to learn, get out of my classroom, go. I'm not going to pretend like I haven't said those exact words. I told kids to just get out of my classroom many times. You don't want to learn, fine, don't be here. But you're not going to mess it up for everyone else. I'm not proud of having said that, but I'll admit that I said it because that's what happens with this limiting belief, right? And it becomes this spiral where you can't stop. You start looking for any opportunity, any minor infraction to push a portion of the kids, the kids that you have deemed as bad, to push them out of the room so that you only have to educate the ones that you deem as good. And it gives you that temporary moment of relief and you just keep doing it 
and to the point where that kid is really not having a rapport or a relationship with you at all anymore. You're just trying to get them out of the room. And you know where this comes from? We have been conditioned as a society to believe that there are good guys and bad guys in the world. And that plays out in how we see our students. Think about it. In almost every single movie you've watched, particularly American movies here, in every TV show, there's the good guys who you're supposed to root for, and there's the bad guys who are trying to destroy everything. And the bad guys are usually very one-dimensional. They want to take over the world because they're power hungry, or they're just totally selfish. They don't think about anybody but themselves, right? And they'll just do anything, steal, kill, whatever, just to get what they want. As a side note, that's what makes movies like Black Panther so incredibly exceptional because they challenge that good guy, bad guy dichotomy. They force us to reconsider the labels and think about who we're rooting for and the complexity of human nature and the complexity of ways people behave beyond just good person, bad person. But see, we see this good guy, bad guy thing from childhood. And so we grow up thinking that's how human nature works. We think the majority of people are good but there's a small portion of the population who are the bad guys. And it's the job of the good guys to stop the bad guys from messing it up for everyone else. In the classroom, we're conditioned to think of ourselves as good guys. We are there to serve the other good guys in our class. Those are the students who want to learn. Those are the kids who want to do well, you know, who are compliant, who go along with what we ask, do their work on time, that sort of thing. But there's always a handful of bad guys in every class. And they're there to disrupt the learning. They don't want to learn. And we feel like it's our job to protect the good guys so that the bad guys don't ruin it for them. And remember, these are not necessarily conscious beliefs. These are worldviews that go unexamined. These are things that have been ingrained in us over the years, and we're not necessarily aware of them. But we can tell if these limiting beliefs are there by examining the things that we say and do. So when we say things like, I don't want to see your face in this classroom anymore. If you don't want to learn, get out. What we're saying is, you're the bad guy. You're keeping all the good guys from accomplishing their goals, and I'm not going to let you do that. I don't really care what happens to you because you're a bad guy. I don't really care whether you learn or get ahead. You're a bad guy. I just want you out of my room. And that leads us to the final limiting belief, which is that punishment, suspension, and expulsion are the only way that disruptive students can be stopped. When we find ourselves or our colleagues talking about how kids just don't care, don't want to learn, they're ruining it for everyone, we have to correct that when we hear it. We have to make mention of the fact that this is a limiting belief that will hold our students back from being successful. We know intellectually that there's many reasons why a student might be disruptive in class or appear unmotivated to learn. And we know as educators that the proper response to those students is to try to uncover that central root issue and address it so the kids can stay in the class and learn. We know our goal is for all students to be successful. And yet, because of this good guy, bad guy mentality that most of us aren't even aware that we have, we still find ourselves intentionally trying to get these kids suspended or expelled. We don't have the supports in place to help us, and we don't want to deal with it. We hold to the line that it's not fair to the other students for these kids to be in the class with them. I mean, I've said that. Go back to episode 99. It's called Why I Let Two Kids' Behavior Ruin My School Year and What I Wish I'd Done Differently. I've said it. I tried to push those kids out because it's easier on me than trying to insist that the school provide the support that I needed in order to educate all my students. I know that you probably don't have the counselors and the other faculty and the programs that you need to help you address the needs of all your learners. Our schools have traditionally just not been set up that way. They were not designed really to meet all kids' needs. And so that burden has been pushed onto individual classroom teachers who don't have the resources for it. I feel like that's getting even more extreme now, and districts are essentially just outsourcing student discipline to the criminal justice system. We're having kids arrested for things like talking back to the teacher or being expelled for not wearing a uniform too many times because the schools don't have the supports in place to handle it. Traditionally speaking, this notion of retribution and punishment is built into the way traditionally that we do school. These are ideals that have been reinforced in our society really since birth. You can see it in our entertainment. You can see it in all the TV shows. Everything is about law and order, crime and punishment, good guys, figuring out how to stop the bad guys. This idea that people need to get what they deserve, they need to pay for their crimes, that mindset is far more ingrained in most of us 
than the idea that people should not be defined by their worst mistake. We are taught to cheer as the bad guys get locked up, as if that is somehow the end of the story and they just disappear forever and that's the end of it. This kind of retribution model is replicated in the way that we discipline kids in schools. And you can check out episode 126 if you want to learn more about that. It's about the school to prison pipeline. But you can choose to think differently. You can recognize that the idea of punishing students with suspensions and expulsions is the only way to stop the good kids from disrupting the bad kids. Recognize that as a limiting belief. It does not serve you or your students well. Use restorative justice practices to teach kids how to take accountability for their choices and how to make restorations for any harm that they cause. A restorative justice approach will help you integrate that student back into your classroom after removal so that the student has the support needed to be successful. The most important thing you can do when you turn off this podcast is to notice and observe when these limiting beliefs pop into your head. Notice when you start to label the good kids and the bad kids. Watch the language that you use when you're talking about your students. Often it's easier to hear yourself than it is to just observe thoughts. Notice any criminalizing words you use, like repeat offenders. And when you hear your colleagues display evidence of these limiting beliefs, gently draw their attention to it. Send them the link to this podcast or this blog post if you want me to explain it. Challenge the stereotypical teacher's lounge complaining about these kids don't care, these kids don't want to learn. And replace those limiting beliefs with a thought like, I am determined not to give up on my students. I will fight for them to have the resources they need to be successful. I will see them as individuals and not as labels. I acknowledge the potential in each child and I speak to that potential each day rather than labeling kids based on their past choices. Each day is a new and fresh start for them and for me. I choose to notice and let go of limiting beliefs that don't serve me or my students well. That's your takeaway truth for the week ahead. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.